Welcome to the first video tutorial for the Skyrim Creation Kit. Over the course of this 10-part series, you'll learn the basics of working with the kit as you follow along with designers from here at Bethesda to create a simple Skyrim level. To get us started with an intro to kit basics, here's level designer Joel Burgess. So the first thing we need to do is just go to our Steam Games Library, and you'll see up here that we actually want to go into Tools. Now you'll find the Creation Kit in here. This is where you'll install it. We've already installed here, so we're just going to launch from Play Game. The Creation Kit will load up pretty quickly, and that's because there's no actual data in here. So the first thing we want to do is go to File, Data, and you'll get something that looks like this. Now the Skyrim.esm is our main master file. This is where all the different forms and objects from the base Skyrim game come. So we want to make sure that that one's loading. Now if you've already got a mod that you've been working on, you'll probably have a plugin file, like this one we have, coolmod.esp. Now if that's where you want to save your changes while you're working, you can set that as the active file, either by clicking here, or by double right, not left, clicking with the mouse. But we want to start something new, so we're actually not going to load coolmod.esp. We just want to load Skyrim, and we'll make our plugin in a minute. Notice down here, this progress bar tells us how far along we are in loading up the ESM. All right, now that the ESM is loaded, you'll notice a lot more data shows up in the screen. For instance, over here we have our object window. And the object window contains all the different folders and hierarchies. We're going to find actors, items, armor, monsters, sounds. Just about anything you can think of can be found through the object window. The object window also has a filter. For instance, if we want to find a kettle, we can type kettle up here. And then we can actually go down into the different categories and try and find a kettle. There's also a special category at the very bottom called all. And we can see that we've instantly found our kettle here. You can try different things. We can look for trolls, and you'll find all the trolls, troll abilities, books about trolls. We'll just leave it at Kettle for now. We'll use that later. We also have the render window. The render window is the area where all 3D objects will appear. Right now it's empty because we don't actually have anything loaded. That's where we come into the cell view. The cell view shows us all the different world spaces we can look at. Right now we're just going to deal with the interiors and it shows us all the different cells in that world space. Just for the time being, let's type in the first few letters of a cell, unowned, and you'll see unowned cell. We want to double click that and load it up. Now you'll notice right away that the render window now has some stuff in it. Also notice that the name on the title bar of the render window has changed. That lets us know which cell is loaded, which can come in handy sometimes. You'll also notice that the right hand side has populated with several objects. This also has a filter. I can type in gen. It'll only show us the GEN kit room pieces. We're going to leave that blank for now so we can see all the objects in the cell. One of the first things you need to know how to do is use the camera. So just clicking into the render window, select any object. We'll just do that by clicking. Try scrolling your mouse wheel, and you'll see that you can zoom in and out this way. There's also a fine detail zoom, which is accomplished by holding down the V key and moving the mouse. And you notice that's a very small zoom by comparison with the mouse wheel. You're going to be using the mouse wheel most of the time. You can also click down on the mouse wheel and move the mouse around to pan. Also try rotating the camera. Notice that I've got this object in the center selected. See the faint red and green box around it? That's called the bounding box. And as I click around different objects, you'll see the bounding box selects all the objects I've selected. But for now, just click on the blue marker, hold down the shift key, and move the mouse to rotate the camera around it. We've actually got that light bulb there selected right now. And so that's what our camera rotates around. If I were to click on this chest, we can make the camera rotate around that as well. Now notice here how I snapped my view to that chest really quickly. I'm zooming out, and what I'm doing now is hitting Shift plus F. And that's the Focus Camera Hotkey. It's similar to hitting the C hotkey, except C cycles through various preset camera positions. Similarly, I can also hit the T key, 
and that will give me a top-down view. Bear in mind, once in a while, it's not uncommon for you to get lost, sort of like this. Your camera's out in the void, the empty space, and I can't really see or orient to anything. Now, if you have something selected, you can hit Shift F, C, or T, and it should snap the view back. But I don't have anything selected right now, so that's not working. So I can go down here into my cell view and double click on any object in this list, and it'll snap the camera right back there. Another handy key for making things easier to see is M. And M stands for markers. And you'll see that this light bulb actor, this blue marker, and this little red X marker all disappear and come back as I toggle that button back and forth. You're going to use this a lot as you begin working with interior cells because often these markers make this space look pretty complicated because we need them for different pieces of logic. Let's go ahead and hide markers for the moment and click on the chest here at the back of the room. I'm going to hit Shift F again so I zoom in and just sort of get a comfortable camera angle that I like. Now notice how when my cursor is over the chest, the icon changes into that sort of four-way cross. That four-way arrow means that I can click and drag, and I'm going to move this object around on the horizontal plane. This is called translation, or moving the object. I can also move it on specific axes. If I hold down the X key, it'll move side to side. If I hold down the Y key, I can move it on the other axis horizontally. And notice that by default, it allows me to move across both those axes. So if I want to move it up and down, I'm going to press and hold Z, and the same thing, it moves up and down. Also, if you have something that's not on the floor and you want it to be, just hit F, and that will drop it down to the nearest collision surface. You can also use the arrow keys. The arrow keys don't do an axis constrained translation, but they can be handy for moving things around quickly. And you can also move things up and down by holding Z and pressing up and down. Another common operation is rotating. To rotate, we simply press and hold the right mouse button and turn the mouse. Similarly, if you press and hold Z while rotating, you'll rotate around the Z axis, hold X for the X axis, and hold Y for the Y axis. We're also able to scale objects, and that's accomplished by holding down the S key and then clicking and dragging. You want to be careful scaling objects. You can create bad looking art or ridiculous looking art this way. We'll talk more about that in later tutorials. For now, I'm just going to control Z to undo that and we'll leave it at the basic size. The creation kit also features some new tools called gizmos. Gizmos are sort of visual helpers for these basic operations. So for instance, if I hit the E key, this is the translation gizmo or movement gizmo. It gives us all the same basic operations, but we can finely tune how we move the object in a visual way. So for instance, when I hover over one of these axes, you'll see the handle, that's this little arrow here, turn yellow. So I'll grab the red handle, and then when I click and drag on it, I just move the object along that axis. Likewise for each other axis, and these little rectangles here, let me move it on a combination of axes. So if I grab this horizontal one, I move on the horizontal axis. If I grab this one along the back side, you'll see I'm moving along two axes here. And similarly, if I grab this other side axis one, or this side plane handle, I can move along these two axes, the green and the blue. If I hit W, I get the rotation gizmo, which following the same logic gives me a circle for each axis that I can rotate the object on. Works just the same way. Hover over till it turns yellow, grab it by clicking and holding, and then drag your mouse to rotate the selected object along those axes. You note there's no multi-axis gizmo for rotation. That's just for translation. There's also the two button for the scale gizmo. Now because this is a static object, I can't non-uniformly scale it. So the axes don't actually mean anything very useful right now. We'll get more into that later when we start dealing with primitives. Also, whenever you've used a gizmo, make sure you press the same hotkey, 2 in this case, to turn it back off so you can resume normal manipulation of the object.
Now let's try dragging a new object into our cell. I'm going to go back over to the object window here, and I'm going to grab one of these kettles. Now this kettle is what you call a base object. The base object is sort of the template from which all instances of the object are created. So in this case, it's a misc item. It's got some weight. It's got a keyword. We don't really care about these properties right now. We're just going to drag in this kettle, and that's a new reference. A reference is sort of like a copy. I can move this around, manipulate it just the same way as I did the chest. I can hit Control D and create new copies of it. And so we'll just scatter some kettles around the room here. Sort of put the chest somewhat back where it was. We're not going to save any of this. We're just learning right now, so don't worry too much. Duplicate another one of these, and we'll make an upside-down kettle. Why not? Also notice, when I move these things around, it's really fluid and smooth. That's because I don't have snapping turned on. If you look up here in the main toolbar, there's two icons with these sort of red shapes. The circular dot is going to turn on grid snapping. Now notice when I translate the object that it sort of pops around. This is because I'm at a 64 unit grid. That means that each time I move the object, it will move 64 units exactly in whatever direction. This becomes really important as we'll cover in the next tutorial with layout. I can also change this value arbitrarily. Bear in mind, factors of 8 work best. 64, 128, 256, 32, numbers like this are perfect. There's also snap to angle. That's this other icon here. Snap to angle means that when I rotate the object, just the same, it's going to rotate a certain number of degrees that we've set. In this case, it's 45 degrees. Now you can toggle that on with the buttons in the main toolbar, which we've already talked about, by snapping here in the render window properties, or once you get quick with this stuff, you can toggle this on by hitting Q, like so. And then you can turn off and on rotation snapping by hitting Control Q, which you'll start doing a lot of as you get more advanced. So one more important detail you're going to want to know early on is how to actually save and test your mod. So far, we haven't actually saved. So let's go ahead and do that now. You can either click the disk icon up here or hit Control S. And then we want to navigate to our Skyrim data folder. For most people, that's going to be in Program Files, Steam, Steam Apps, Common, Skyrim, data. You'll see here that other plugin we saw earlier is already in this folder. So we're just going to call this test mod 01 or whatever you prefer and we'll save it. Notice now that test mod 01 appears in the title bar of the creation kit. This indicates that this is our active file. This is the one and only plugin to which our changes will be saved each time we hit the save key. So let's run it in game now. You can either use your regular Skyrim shortcut or go to your games library again and run the game. This is going to bring up the launcher. From the launcher, click on data files, and we'll see here that we have these various checkboxes. Test mod 01 is already checked, which means we're going to load it. You can also tell the game not to load certain mods, so we're going to turn off coolmod.esp. We just want to load Skyrim and test mod 01. We'll hit OK. And let's run the game. Okay. So once we're at the main menu of the game, we want to pull up the console. To do that, just hit tilde. The console is where we can enter all kinds of different commands that help us test the game. Right now, we want to just go to the mod cell that we created. So we're going to type COC, that stands for Center on Cell, un owned cell. Go ahead and hit enter and it'll start loading. Now notice we're right where that blue marker was. That's actually what that mark is for. So we're looking at a blank wall, but if we turn around, 
we see all the kettles, we see the modified position of the chest, and that's basically it. We've gone ahead and jumped in the editor, made our own plugin, and tested it in the game. With this basic knowledge, you should be set to follow through the rest of the tutorials and begin experimenting with the Creation Kit. Can't wait to see what you come up with. That's all for our first episode. Join us next time as Justin Schramm helps us lay the foundation of our first project with basic layout. In the meantime, you can visit creationkit.com for more information.